this lecture is going to be looking at the factors that affect subject choice. So here we're really going to be focusing on GCSE and A-level as those are the area, uh, times in your education where you get to make a choice about which subjects you study and which subjects you are going to be examined in. So we're going to look at the trends, first of all, and see what's happening in terms of the trends for subject choice at GCSE and A-level and then consider which fa the factors which affect the choice, looking at gender, ethnicity, and class. So in the exam, you could be asked about any one of these three areas and how they impact subject choice. And it's kind of bringing together a lot of things that we've already talked about in terms of educational achievement, the role and function of education, pro roles and processes. So it's kind of bringing everything together just to in a, in a new context. So let's first of all look at the trends. If we're looking at GCSE, so on we've got here a um, graph that shows the differences between male and female subject choice in 2019. It was the most up-to-date one I could find. And what we can see here is that obviously the sciences and the maths are pretty even. Um, with slight variations depending on the makeup of the year group at that particular time. So some year groups have slightly more boys than girls and vice versa. And they are um, compulsory subjects. So everyone's, almost everybody takes those subjects. Now, if we look to um, the more humanities based subjects, and the more um, performing arts based subjects, we see that we start to see the trend of more girls than boys within that. And that's particularly um, present in home economics, health and social care, performing and expressive arts. And the social science subjects, although they're heading towards um, equal, they're still quite considerably more females than males in those subjects. Um, yeah, if we look at the more technical subjects, design technology, engineering, computing, we see a higher number of boys. So what this suggests to us is that there is a kind of gendered choice in subjects and which subjects people take. Now, unfortunately, we don't have data on social class and subject choice or in terms of ethnicity. And subject choice. So the data we've got really focuses in on gender, but we're going to look at other factors that can also explain that as well. When we get to A level, we still see this kind of um, humanities and um, arts based subjects compared to technical subjects seeing similar kind of trends sociology, English literature, art and design type subjects, psychology, drama, English all seem to have a predominantly female subject, whereas uh, politics, design technology, maths, business studies tend to be more male dominated, computing being the most male dominated subject at A level, um, closely followed by physics. So again, we're seeing this kind of trend in gender that leads to a gendered subject image. So we're going to look at gender and subject choice first of all. So what is it about these subjects that draw more boys to them or more girls to them? Why don't we see that kind of 50-50 split in subjects? Now obviously there is an element of personal choice in these subjects, particularly at A-level when you're looking at what you want to do perhaps at university level or career wise and require certain subjects. So we can't dismiss individual choice. And as the postmodernists would argue that that is the predominant um, factor is the fact that in a postmodernist society, we have free will. We social structures such as class, um, ethnicity and gender have less of a role to play or no role to play in our decision making. Late modernists, however, would argue that they, these factors, these social structures still have a role to play. And that's why we're still looking at them. Um, so the first factor we need to think about 
is gender role socialization. And this suggests that girls and boys are raised differently and that can channel them into different subjects at school. So Norman, and that's the surname, not the first name, talks about how um, as young children, girls and boys are given different activities to, to do, different games to play. So girls tend to be quite homemakery, they're given dolls to play with, caring type role play, baking, cooking, things like that. Boys are more kind of active, more technical, they might be helping de um, with uh, DIY in the house, they might be given um, like Meccano kits and Legos and things like that. And that can kind of give the impression that certain activities are more masculine and others are more feminine. Murphy and Elwood take this link this again back to the bedroom culture and that girls tend to read more fiction, which leads to more expressive subjects. Boys tend to read more hobby type, type books, which leads to more technical subjects. So by girls reading the fiction, they're drawn towards the English literature and drama and maybe history and things like that. Boys with the hobby books, so books about dinosaurs or um, more factual based books, tends to lead them towards the sciences, towards the technical subjects. Now, Brown and Ross talk about such gender domains. And what they mean by this is certain areas of life, certain activities in life are seen as the domain of men or the domain of women. For example, men, uh, a male domain would be DIY, mechanics. A female domain would be cooking and the, um, sewing and, and arty and crafty and things like that. And what they argue is that um, children see these gender domains and create a, an idea about acceptable, behave, acceptable activities for men and women, and that can influence their subject choice. So it could be that they have seen um, that um, men are go out to work and they're businessmen and they're things like that, which would lead boys towards more business studies um, and economics type subjects. Girls see women um, reading and doing quiet activities, which could lead them more towards things like English literature and um, textiles and arts based subjects. A second factor when it comes to gender, gender and subject choice is what's referred to as gendered subject image. And this comes from the from um, the sociologist Kelly, again, surname, not first name. Um, and they argue that gender, um, certain subjects at GCSE and the A level have a particular gendered view. So people see it as more of a boy subject or more of a girl subject. And Kelly argues that science is seen as a boy subject due to there being more male teachers in science. Textbook illustrations tend to focus on boys' interests such as sport um, and where um, whichever gender dominates the lesson can influence the gender image. For example, girls tend to dominate in drama and the arts, whereas boys dominate in PE. So it can be that the um, experiences of a subject, whether it be the type of teacher you have, whether they're male or female, the dynamics of the group that you're in, um, can influence whether you see that subject as a subject for girls or subject for boys. Now, obviously, there are neutral subjects um, where we get around 50 50 of each, um, but the, the, in the vast majority of subjects, we do see a gender split. The third and final um, factor when it comes to gender and education and subject choice is gender identities and peer group pressures. And what we're talking about here is that students can face extreme pressure to conform to gender stereotypes in order to be accepted by their peers. So they don't want to appear not fe unfeminine or not masculine by taking certain subjects um, because that can lead to bullying. 
as Dewar points out, um, when students opt for subjects of the opposite domain to their um, gender, they can be subjected to name calling and bullying. Um, for example, uh, when a boy, for example, may take drama or um, art or something like that, they might get um, they might be con called names or bullied for for wanting to be in that subject. Oh, food tech, another example. Piacher, and I'm probably horribly mispronouncing that, talks about sport as an example here. And in her, their study of um, subject choice and gender, what, she, what they found was, and I think it's a she, that a number of girls who were very good at sport in year nine, for example, um, or year eight, depending on which year group you do your subject choice in, chose not to take PE as a GCSE subject because they would be called names um, for being unfeminine or butch or um, too sporty. It's not seen as a feminine subject to take, to, to take. And it's seen as a very male dominated subject. Now, these obviously still play a factor in, and different people will react to these factors differently. Some people will just ignore them and get on with it anyway. Some people will be very influenced by them. Postmodernists believe that, the gen are, that we are moving into a gender neutral society where these issues are no longer the case. If you, you might agree with that, you might not. Um, but there's a lot of work being done to de-gender subject image. So, for example, in food technology, there may be talk about the um, famous male chefs, and there are more famous male chefs than there are female ones. Um, in textiles, you could talk about um, the famous fashion designers who are men. And again, there are more famous fashion designers who are male than there are female. In sports, you're talking about female sports heroes, Olympians, um, high level athletes who are all female. The fact that the British football female football team tends to do better than the male one, and the same with the rugby team. Um, not all the time, but um, more often than not, and um, starts to break down those gendered subject images. And as we've talked about before, when we talked about gender and um, educational achievement, there is a kind of degenderization or a diversification of materials where we are seeing more um, of each gender um, in textbooks and in resources and things like that. We've, you would have also covered in families and households the gender neutral parenting that's occurring, where parents are allowing children to just be children um, and not forcing certain toys upon certain children, so dolls upon girls, trucks and dinosaurs on um, boys. And you'll know from me talking about my niece and nephew, my, my niece does like her, her dollies. Um, however, she also very much likes her superheroes, which is why they end up having arguments over who is going to be Elsa Hulk and who is going to be Elsa Spider-Man. Um, my nephew has a doll that he sometimes has, carries around with him. Um, my, he was given it when my sister was pregnant with my niece. Um, but it's his baby. He also occasionally wears a tutu on his head, but he's four, so we'll let him go. Um, so there's a lot more gender neutral parenting happening, which can kind of redefine those gender domains and the symmetrical family starts breaking down those um, gender domains that we see in families, which can affect subject choice. Really good synoptic links there for you, matching families and households to education. Next, we'll talk we'll look at um, ethnicity and subject choice. So again, we're going to be linking back to some of the issues that we highlighted when we talked about ethnicity and educational achievement. So, for example, the ethnocentric curriculum. Um, BAME students may be put off from studying certain subjects because they see them as very ethnocentric. They may not want to study A level history, uh, sorry, GCSE or A level history because it focuses too much on Western white history. 
they may not want to study English because the the novels um, in English lit are dead white men or um, very Western authors. There's not a lot of diversification there. Um, so that kind can, can put ethnic minority students off studying certain subjects because they see it as it's not for me. It doesn't represent me. It doesn't represent my culture. Um, so I'm not going to take that subject. I don't have an interest in that subject. We also need to look at English as an additional language. Some students may be channeled towards less essay based subjects or less um, verbal um, subjects such as drama because it's seen as their English language isn't good enough for those subjects. Um, so they may be pushed into more practical subjects where they they don't have to write as much or they don't have to speak as much because of their level of English proficiency. And finally, there's labelling. And as we've said, with education, uh, ethnicity and educational achievement, um, some students from ethnic minorities can be labelled as less able or disruptive and perhaps pushed away from certain subjects because they haven't um, performed very well in those subjects in earlier year groups due to this, um, being labelled as disruptive. They may be fulfilling a self-fulfilling prophecy because they see they've been told so often that they're not able. So that can then lead to them being in lower sets and streams, which can then limit the options that are available to them, particularly if the school uses a streaming system where by it might be the top band of groups might have more options um, than um, the bottom group and that the bottom group might be um, given less options so they can have more time in the core subjects in order to ensure that they get good grades in those core subjects. So that labelling that we talked about in ethnicity and educational achievement and why certain ethnic minorities might be underachieving in education, it could be down to the fact that they don't have as much subject choice when it comes to picking their GCSEs or their A-levels because they are labelled as underachieving before they even get there. OK, now, obviously, again, we've seen changes in curriculum. There's been a lot of talk recently about decolonising the curriculum expanding the um, cultural um, and multiculturalism of the various different subjects that we teach, not focusing purely on Western or white Western experiences. So there's um, more ethnic minorities and um, a wider di and more diverse texts that are studied in English. Um, in history, they're looking at um, introducing African history into the A-level. Not there yet, but it, 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 it's on, on discussion. It's on the, it's on the table. Um, the plays that are discussed in drama are becoming more diversified. So we are seeing that there is a um, a change occurring, which opens more opportunities. Now, a lot of schools now no longer stream their students because of studies into labelling and self-fulfilling prophecy and how it um, can be seen as a form of institutional racism because of the labelling of ethnic minorities. So that's kind of not quite happening. And the introduction of the EBAC kind of was the death knell of streaming because now schools need to focus in on those EBAC subjects if they're going to get up on the league tables. So there are changes occurring. The final factor is class. And again, we're linking back here to the factors which um, we looked at in class and educational achievement. But material factors are a key indicator as to why certain people may not take certain subjects. Um, for, for example, they may feel excluded from certain topics such as art or music because they can't afford the additional costs of music lessons or art um, materials. Um, they may not feel like they can do drama because they can't afford the theatre trips. 
and things like that. Now, obviously, under COVID, there hasn't been that many trips, but um, usually there are. So coming from a disadvantaged background, coming from a deprived background, may limit which A-levels you take because, or GCSEs that you take because you can't afford the additional costs that come with doing that subject. And it's not often that schools are upfront about those things. They won't necessarily say, well, if you're going to take drama, you've got to be prepared to pay this, 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 and this, because you have to go on these trips. If you're going to do geography, you're going to have to pay to go on the field trip to do your um, coursework. If you're going to do um, art, you're going to have to buy these materials to be able to do your art um, work. So it, it's not often that schools are very upfront about these things. They, they tend to be hidden costs that suddenly appear throughout your GCSEs or A-levels. There's also that the, the idea of cultural deprivation and a class-based subject image. So um, it's argued that particularly more vocational, more technical subjects, where it leads directly into a um, career path, things like business, um, design technology um, and, and those sort of subjects, working class students can see a career at the end of those qualifications. So um, subjects such as drama and English, modern foreign languages are seen as more middle class um, subjects because you do need an, a certain element of cultural um, capital to engage in those subjects um, if you uh, want to achieve high grades. There's an assumption of cultural capital there and that can put people off choosing those subjects as well. And again we've got labelling. So working class students may be pushed towards less academic and more vocational subjects because they are labelled as being less able. They are labelled as not having the academic ability to to do certain subjects um, and it may not be that they don't have the ability maybe they just lack some of the cultural capital to access the curriculum or the material um, factors which means that they don't have the materials to be able to access the curriculum but labeling lower down in the school will influence the subjects that people take because they may be pushed towards certain subjects more than others um, however as we've said before, we, there is now pupil premium and students who are considered pupil premium, who can access that funding, it takes away that material deprivation because the, it provides funding for the school to be able to buy the materials or pay for the trips that students need. Now, this only works up to GCSE. There is no pupil premium for A-level, but most sixth forms will have a hardship fund or they will have a, um, a, a way of supporting um, disadvantaged students. In terms of the cultural factors, it can be argued that if you've got a culturally um, strong key stage three, that shouldn't be a limiting factor on going into key stage four and on to key stage five. So it, it's, it, it shouldn't be a cultural deprivation issue because you would have had a broad and balanced curriculum at key stage three or should have a broad and balanced curriculum at key stage three. So this one's quite a short lecture really but the main factors affecting subject choice is gender, ethnicity and social class. Now it would be up to you to decide which one of those, these three has the biggest impact and or whether or not you believe that they have an impact at all. Maybe you're coming from a postmodernist view where you believe that we actually do have freedom of choice here and it's not due, not um, the social structures that are dictating our op opportunities and options at 16 and 18. But that's up to you to decide.